2 Corinthians chapter 1. I thought I'd mention one of the books I'm, I'm using uh, as a commentary is by Warren W. Wearsby. It's called Be Encouraged. If, uh, if you had opportunity to get that, uh, that would be a blessing to you. He goes through in, uh, I think, 13, 12 or 13 studies, the book of, of 2 Corinthians. That would be a good addition to your library. Don't take mine, though. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we looked at last week, and one of the things you'll notice about life is everybody struggles. <laughs> uh, verse 8, Paul talks about, uh, we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. That's the Apostle Paul, you know, it was a struggle. I came across a quote I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. That's a quote from Charles Spurgeon, <laughs> the Prince of Preachers in, in London some years ago. Uh, everybody struggles. And in 2 Corinthians, God gives us some encouragement with, with these struggles. Uh, one of the things we saw last week is that this is one of the ways God equips us to help others. In verse 4, he says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God helps us in our struggles. We get a solution and help and encouragement from Him, and then we're able to share it with others. As well, he says that in our troubles, we, we learn to get rid of false faith. There in verse 9, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. We tend to trust ourselves. And God through troubles helps us to see, no, that's not where my faith should be. I can trust the Lord. And then uh, we just touched on last week, and we want to continue with this thought. Uh, troubles as well help us to realize that the best way to operate is with a clear conscience. Yeah, when you're in trouble, you don't want to add to it that you got a bad conscience about it. You know, trouble just makes more trouble. Uh, verse 12, uh, he says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. We'll, we'll read more of that in, in just a moment. Uh, you know, Paul, uh, in 2 Corinthians, Paul had, in 1 Corinthians, said that he was going to come and see them. If you look back at chapter 16, verse 5 uh, of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians should be just across the page, he said to them, Now I will come unto you when I, I shall pass through Macedonia. For I do pass through Macedonia. It may be that I will abide ye in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. So Paul had hoped to see them, uh, but his plans changed. In uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 23, he says, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. He had some things and some reasons why he wasn't able to come and why he didn't want to come. And evidently some of them accused him of deception or, or carelessness. Uh, they ignored that when in, in, he said it in 1 Corinthians, he said, If, if the Lord will. Uh, where was it there? If, if the Lord permit. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things in life where we say now, I'm going to do this if the Lord permit. You know, we might say, if the Lord wills. But we just don't know about, there's many things we don't know about life. And uh, yeah, as Paul uh, was telling them he was coming, he had to say, well, if the Lord permits. And then his, his plans changed. But you know, Paul was able to approach this with a clear conscience. Because he hadn't deceived them, he hadn't uh, misled them or anything. L look in, uh, let me read following on in verse 12 there. He says, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we'd ha we've had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you word. For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And one of the things he's saying there is, I'm not writing one thing to you and a different thing to somebody else. He's not saying, I'm going to come see you, and then to somebody else, uh, I told him I'd see him, but I'm not going to go see him. <laughs> he says, you've, you've read everything I've written. 
Verse 14. As also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that you might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you be brought on my way toward Judea. He said, I would planned and hoped to go and see you, and then go to Macedonia, and then come back and see you on the way back. Uh, verse 17, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? Uh, he, he's saying, I wasn't trifling with you. He said, this wasn't just some foolish thing I was saying. He said, this is what, uh, uh, these were some plans that we'd, we'd hoped uh, to, to follow. Uh, Paul had a, a clear conscience in, in dealing with them. You know, that's the best way to approach life. Uh, just keep your conscience clear. Keep it honest. Keep it right. Keep it just. Uh, you know, he, he said in verse 15, he was minded to come. Uh, in verse 17, uh, he said he wasn't dealing with them with, with lightness. Uh, he wasn't, uh, wasn't fooling with them. Uh, let, let me give you another example in Paul's life of, of a good conscience in Acts chapter 24, and then we'll get back to uh, 2 Corinthians there. In Acts 24, you're probably familiar with the situation. Paul was arrested and accused of some things. And it's a good example um, of how to, the best way to deal with when you're accused. Verse 5 and 6, they, they said, We have found this man a pestilent fellow. Man, if you got arrested for being a pest... Uh, we'd all be in trouble. A mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Naz Nazarenes who also hath gone about to profane the temple. Here's the charge. Whom we took and have, would have judged according to our law. Uh, so the, the, the accusation was he was profaning the temple. But you know, the, the best argument when you're accused is to do right and to have done right. Uh, verse 13 he was able to say, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. So they can accuse me, but they can't prove it because it's not, not true. It's like he said in 2 Corinthians, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. Uh, that's the best place to be. Uh, to Just simply, in godly sincerity, by the grace of God, to, to live your life. In uh, Acts 24, verse 18, he explains what was happening. He says, Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had aught against me, or else I let these same here say if, if they found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. He said, there was witnesses there. He said, they, if they wanted to charge me, they, they could be here. The best argument when you're accused is to have done right. And he was not only doing right, but in verse 14, he was doing right to worship God. This I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. And he was doing right because he believed it was God's word, and God's will. He was doing it because his hope was in the Lord, verse 15, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow. He talks about the resurrection. Uh, you know, in life, there, there's going to come a lot of different situations. And, you know, in 2 Corinthians, he, he talks about having a right conscience, not with fleshly wisdom. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 12. We need to be careful that we don't try and apply fleshly wisdom. Here's what happens. Uh, many times people violate their conscience for fleshly wisdom. They want to avoid a consequence. You know, fleshly wisdom says... Oh, you don't want that consequence, so change what you're doing. But listen, if you're doing right, you need to keep doing what's right. Fleshly wisdom is going to mislead you. Um, many times we violate our conscience uh, to, to get something. You know, if I just fudge the books a little bit, I'll, boy, I'll make a lot more money. If I just cheat a little bit, uh, you know, I'll be a lot better off. No, that's, uh, uh, that's fleshly wisdom. God's wisdom says just do what's right and leave the consequences up to God. I don't want to give away the punchline here to, to the message, but you know, the more I studied this, the more I saw how conscience and faith go together. 
and uh, you'll see some of the verses that, that we look at. Uh, we often violate our conscience either to avoid a consequence or to gain a consequence. And uh, there in, in Acts chapter 24, in uh, verses 16 and 17, he said, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That's a great verse about conscience. It would be a good verse to memorize. I do exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. And listen what he was doing, verse 17. Now after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. You know what he was doing? He was paying his taxes. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of times with taxes where we, we void our conscience. Uh, he's just saying, I was there to do the right thing. I was you know, bringing offerings to my, to my country. And uh, he, he had a clear conscience in all that was going on. Well, let's get back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Living with a clear conscience. Uh, he gives us several things in this passage that I think will help you. A person with a clear conscience is going to live in light of Jesus' return. Verses 13 and 14 there of 2 Corinthians 1. Uh, I'll read many of these verses more than once. Verse 13, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And that's referring to Jesus' return. And you know, to have a good conscience, you need to keep eternity in mind. It will help you. And if you just look at the immediate things, man, you can, you can play tricks with your conscience. But if you'll think about standing before the Lord, if you'll think about eternity, uh, it, it'll make a, a big difference. Eternity puts a different perspective on everything. You stop and think about that. Eternity puts a different perspective on everything. You know the misunderstandings we have. You don't have to think of an exact one right now, but you know, most misunderstandings are so petty, aren't they? Some little thing, some misunderstanding, uh, some twisting of, of the truth sometimes. Listen, in eternity, that'll all be sorted out. Uh, we, we had a teacher, I had a teacher at university that used to say, if you want to see how important something is, stop and think what you're going to think of it in 20 years. He said, most of these things you won't even be able to remember. <laughs> Well, listen, you put that in light of eternity and what a difference it makes. You know, the little arguments we have as, you know, as friends or husband and wife or whatever, most of it's just rubbish, isn't it? Just little things that in eternity will, will mean nothing. Um, uh, living in light of eternity will help your conscience. And a person with a clear conscience lives in light of eternity. Secondly, a person with a clear conscience is serious about the will of God. Look at verses 15 to 18. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you be brought on my way toward Judea. Now what he's saying there is, this is what I, I'd hoped to do. When I therefore was thus minded, did I, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. What he's saying is, this wasn't just something I wanted to do for, for me. He said, this wasn't just something to please me. He said, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the will of God. Uh, a person with a clear conscience is going to be serious about the will of God. They're going to seek the leading of the Lord. Now, in seeking the leading of the Lord, sometimes you're going to be able to read in the Bible and know exactly what God wants. Don't lie. Do be a part of a church. You know, there's positives and negatives. For thus saith the Lord. But you know, there's a lot of things like Paul's trip. You know, Paul had said, you know, I hope to go see you, and then go to Macedonia, come back to see you. Well, well listen, he, he couldn't find that in the Bible. <laughs> At least it wasn't in the Old Testament. And you know, there's a lot of things in life where it doesn't, it doesn't say, thus saith the Lord. You should buy a gold-colored car. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that, does it? Um, you, they're just things that we're, we're not always going to be sure about. But we need to be serious about seeing, well, what does God want us to do? Uh, there's a scripture in Acts chapter 16. I won't read the whole thing to you, but 
It's when they were, they were going out as missionaries. Acts 16, verse 6. So when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the regions of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. You see what he's saying? And they thought, we'll go here and preach the gospel. And uh, somehow the Holy Spirit let them know, no, I don't want you to go there. And, and there were several uh, times like that as they, they were serious about the will of God. They were serious. They wanted to preach in that area. God said, no, maybe another time. And uh, what we don't want to get in the way is our, is our conscience. You know, there's things where the Holy Spirit can lead us, but you know, it's not going to be thus saith the Lord. And if our conscience gets in the way, you know, there, there might be a place God wants you to go, but you don't want to go there because that guy that you're mad at lives there. <laughs> I remember, I think I've shared this, this before, but the last day I was at one church, we turned the church over to someone else. They'd called another pastor, and, and uh, we, we were leaving. The very day we were leaving, a, a guy called me, and I, he asked me to come and see him. And I just have to say, he, he just really offended me. <laughs> he just laid into me and gave me, you know, what for. And, and a couple hours later, I'm on the plane, you know, leaving. And I thought, man, that's, that's hard. But, you know, I, I realized I had a choice what I could do with that. And I didn't know, you know, he was training for the ministry and you know, all kinds of things. And I thought, you know, who knows? Maybe God will want us to work together someday. So I made sure that I was clear. I made sure that my conscience was clear. And that from my part, we'd, if God wanted us to work together, we'd be able to. That I wouldn't say, oh, I can't go there. I don't like that guy. <laughs> now, we need to have a clear conscience. Uh, we need to be serious about the will of God. Um, in, uh, in raising our children, one of the things I tried to get across to them was, don't do things that will limit what God can do with you. You know, there's, there's things that we can do in, in our life that will, will just stop us from being able to serve the Lord in certain ways. You know, I'd encourage them, listen, you know, don't get into drugs, you know, don't, don't get into sex. And, you know, there's just lots of things where, you know, if we give ourselves to sin, it's going to limit us. And God wants to be able to be uh, later on we'll read a verse where he says the promises of God are yay and amen you know? God wants to be able to say yeah go for it and we don't want to be limited by uh, sin and, and by our conscience Jesus said in Matthew 5.37 let your communications be yea yea, nay, nay <laughs> for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil all he's saying is don't make a big song and dance about what you're doing it's either right or it's wrong it's either God's will or it's not. You know, don't try and excuse it and make up reasons for it. He was dealing with the Pharisees. Man, they were masters at uh, explanations. We need to be careful that we're just plain and simple. Uh, live by faith, not by figuring. It's a good statement. Keep the way open. And, and you know, as, as Christians, we need to keep our word. But you know, there's sometimes when situations will change and we'll just have to, have to let people know we can't do what we had hoped to do. Uh, Paul had to say, you know, I, I hope if God permits to come and see you. But then he had to say, no, I, things have changed. I can't come and see you. Now, I, I don't know if, how this fits in there, but, you know, sometimes you might owe a bill. Not me, but I'm in a bill. And uh, unable to pay it. Listen, as a Christian, the thing to do is call them and talk to them. My bill's due today. I'm unable to pay. I will pay. Uh, what can I do? You know, just be honest and open. Let your yay be yay and your, your nay be nay. Uh, a Christian with a clear conscience is serious about the will of God. Thirdly, a Christian uh, with a clear conscience is concerned to glorify God. If you look there in verses 19 and 20, he says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. This is the verse I was talking about. For all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him amen, unto the glory of God by us. We, we want to live for the glory of God. We want God to be able to say, Bill, this is what I want you to do. Yes, Lord. 
ready and willing. Your glory is what's important. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he said, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, eating and drinking is very normal, isn't it? Very mundane. <laughs> well, the normal things of life, we need to do them for the glory of God. And then whatsoever, you know, whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, look there, it's just across the page in my Bible. He says, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God and the sight of God speak we in Christ. Uh, we need to be careful that we're not practicing deception. We need to be concerned to glorify God. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, he says, Have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, we need to be careful that we're not trying to manipulate people. You know, we're, we're not uh, people who want to manipulate the Bible. We want to know what it really says and what it really means and live by it. Uh, if you've been around very long, you know that in religion, there's plenty of people who will try and trick you, and manipulate you. Uh, as a pastor, I get, uh, not so much now, but when I first came, I used to get lots of phone calls. And, you know, people wanting this and people wanting that. Uh, I worked at a big church for a while in the States, and uh, I was the guy that took the phone calls. Uh, everybody, they were always Baptists, and uh, they, they always needed money. I don't know why, how, how that was, you know. But, um, and so I would, I would very kindly say, well, let's contact your church that you're from. Your pastor will want to help you. Anyway, that's another story. But uh, We need to be careful that we're not trying to manipulate people. We want to we live for the glory of God. Uh, I heard of a, a young pastor who you know, his church wasn't given like he thought it should. And he knew of an older pastor whose church really gave. And uh, so he asked him, he said, what can I do to get our church to give? And the older pastor said, well, what I do is I hypnotize him. He said, I get my watch going, and I just talk low and slow, and then I say, give. Man, they give. All right, he said, I'll try it. So he got his watch, and man, he was talking low and slow, and, and then his watch chain broke. He said, oh, puke. Took him two weeks to clean up the church. <laughs> now, that's a joke. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's people who are just trying to manipulate the situation. A clear conscience won't do that. that that's the point. A clear conscience is going to look for the glory of God. And uh, we might uh, be praised. We might be humbled. Uh, but it's the glory of God that's important. We leave the consequences up to Him. Someone said it's never right to do wrong so that right will result. You know, we know it's not right to do wrong. But sometimes we think, if I just did that one little wrong, it would be a lot better. Listen, it's never right to do wrong so that right will result. A person with a clear conscience lives in light of Christ's return, is serious about the will of God, is concerned to glorify God, and then fourthly, honors the Holy Spirit. Now, you can see in, in Paul's life, you know, he was really dependent on the, the Holy Spirit to guide him. And as Christians, uh, you know, God's Holy Spirit is there to guide us. If we want to have a clear conscience, uh, we need to listen. It uses several verses here. Verse 21, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Uh, that word establishes uh, is guarantees. What it's saying is the contract will be fulfilled. The one who establishes you is, is the Lord. We have the, the Holy Spirit's guarantee and hath anointed us. We have his anointing. This is something that comes up, and pardon me saying it, but many times this is part of people who are deceiving using the word of God, uh, talking about anointing this and anointing that. And, uh, in 1 John chapter 2, he says, Ye have an unction, that's, the word, that's an anointing, from the Holy Ghost, and you know all things. 1 John 2, 27, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. You have all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. <laughs> he doesn't come in parts. Uh, we need to honor the Holy Spirit. The, the problem is not 
if you're saved, whether you have the Holy Spirit, it's does the Holy Spirit have you? That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's something we need to be concerned about. You know, the Bible says that we have the Holy Spirit. Romans 5 and, and verse 5, for instance, he says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. We have the Holy Spirit when we get saved. That's what salvation is. We receive the Lord. And uh, the question is, are we letting the Holy Spirit lead us? Are we letting the Holy Spirit guide us? Uh, he says as well in verse 22 of 2 Corinthians, who hath also sealed us. Uh, we have his, uh, the seal of the Holy Spirit. He repeats this again in, in Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and, and verse 13. It says, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Then he says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. It's God's down payment. It's God's promise. Same as he says here in, uh, in 2 Corinthians, and given the earnest of the Spirit uh, in our hearts. Uh, we, what that's saying, when we have the, the, uh, uh, the earnest of the Spirit, he's saying you're a genuine part. You know, when you buy parts for your car, you can get fake parts and bad parts and, and so on. Uh, well, God's earnest, he, it's his stamp saying, this is a genuine believer. God's Holy Spirit. And uh, we need to be careful that we walk in the Spirit. Uh, God's Holy Spirit works in our spirit. He uses the Word of God. And uh, if we're going to have a clear conscience, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll work through His Word. Finally, um, a, a person with a clear conscience lives to serve. Verse 23 and 24 there, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. See, Paul's concern was to work together with them. His concern was that he be able to serve them. He wanted to be a helper of their joy. You, you know, the, uh, the section, verse 12, started, our rejoicing is this. In verse 24, he brings it down to uh, helpers of, of your joy. You know, we're fellow servants. No matter what our position in a church, uh, we're all fellow servants. We're all equal before God. We stand by faith. Uh, we help each other. And we need to have that, that clear conscience. In Baptist doctrine, we have a couple of, uh, of statements that, uh, that cover this. The priesthood of the believers. You know, we're all priests uh, before the Lord. And the, the, the teaching the Bible gives of soul liberty. And he says there, uh, not for that we have dominion over your faith. You know, it's not that one Christian has dominion over another. Uh, we have soul liberty. Uh, we, we're uh, individuals uh, before the Lord. And it's important that we and that we have our conscience right before God with simplicity and godly sincerity uh, by the grace of God. Your conscience will greatly affect your joy. That's what he brings it down to. Uh, God intends his spirit to work with our spirit. Uh, you know, Paul said there in, in Acts 24, verse 16, I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. You know, it's interesting, e even the world has a certain conscience. H have you noticed how, what word should I use here, condemning the world can get? Um, Barnaby Joyce does the wrong thing. A and he does the wrong thing. He did the wrong thing. But boy, uh, you know, the world, they are, are so, I'm trying to think, the, the word I'm looking for here, self, that's it, yeah, so self-righteous. Um, the Bible says in Romans 2.15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Uh, you know, there's a certain conscience in every person, but it's usually, it's mainly used to accuse and excuse. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, not, it's not there for the glory of God, it's not there for the leading of the Holy Spirit, all the things we've been talking about. Uh, there's a certain conscience in every person. And uh, uh, we need to be careful that that's not the way uh, we work in the world. Now, the Bible's, the next verse says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. You know, God is the judge. Uh, God is the standard. And uh, we need to listen to God. We need to listen to His Word and His Holy Spirit. We need to let our conscience bring joy. 
Uh, there's going to be uh, lots of opportunities for us to damage our conscience. Uh, you know, the Bible gives several uh, verses where, where he talks about people putting away their conscience. Yeah, don't do that. You know, when, when God is dealing with, with your heart, with your spirit, don't just push it aside. Uh, listen to the Lord. In, in 1 Timothy 4, he talks about having a seared conscience. Uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, in Titus, he talks about having a defiled conscience. And uh, you know, that's, that's where we, we do wrong and say we're doing right. But let me show you one verse before we quit. It's Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. And as I looked at these, uh, th this is the main one, I think, that affects us as Christians. We can ignore our conscience. We can defile our conscience. In Hebrews 9, verse 14, he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, I think a lot of times as Christians we try to trick our conscience. We substitute dead works for what God actually wants us to do. And I think this is a big problem for, for, many, for, for many times as, as Christians. You know, God has His will, His, the leading of His Holy Spirit. We say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm busy for the Lord. I'm doing, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. God says, I want you to do this. Oh, I'm busy. You know, we substitute dead works. We know that faith without works is wrong, but we often accept works without faith. We need to be led of the Lord. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I, I was amazed when I saw how often the Lord brings conscience and faith together. You know, Paul said he, he exercised himself to have a conscience always right before God and man. And that's the way we need to be. Uh, God brings us back to faith in uh, 1 Timothy Chapter 1 and, and verse 5. Just, just listen to these. He says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Conscience and faith. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience. In uh, 1 Timothy 3 verse 9, he says, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now they go together. God's word. And our, and our conscience. Uh, God wants us to, uh, to be led by His Holy Spirit. He wants us to be led by, by His Word. And you know, when, uh, when we uh, do wrong, God has a cure for that. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, we just need to get it right. We need to take responsibility. Sometimes you'll have a problem with somebody, and they'll be mostly wrong, but you know, they're mostly wrongs, not the part you have to worry about. It's the bit of wrong that you did. Sometimes, yeah, I've had it happen where somebody is totally wrong, but then my response to them is wrong. And I think, man, now I've got to deal with my response to them, <laughs> to have a clear conscience. And God says that our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. You want to have rejoicing? Deal with that conscience. Don't push it aside. Uh, don't substitute something else. Uh, don't try and redefine what's right and wrong. Just listen to the Lord. Let faith and conscience. The Bible says there at the end of chapter 1, by faith you stand. By faith you stand. And of course it's true. Let me ask you, how's your conscience? Is it standing by faith? Maybe the Lord is bringing someone or something to mind that you need to, to deal with. Uh, I've known people who years later have paid back something they stole. You know, God dealt with their heart, and they go back to a boss 20 years ago. Boss, <laughs> here's what I've stole, plus interest. Um, are you able to say with Paul, my rejoicing is this, the testimony of my conscience, in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, I've had my conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. Are you able to say that? By God's grace, we can. Let's go to him in, in prayer this evening. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, thank you that you do deal with us so graciously and kindly, and yet, uh, Lord, you, you deal with us in a holy manner. Father, help us to have a conscience that's pure towards you and, and towards man. 
Uh, Lord, help us to be right with, with those around us. Father, I pray if there are any here tonight that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would deal with them regarding that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.